Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Delhi branch. Let me start with a quote from the mother. A sleep in uh, yoga is uh, not just a way of relaxing, not just a, a pleasurable activity. It is not even just something for uh, repair and healing and restoration of energy so that we are able to work the next day. It can also be a means of sadhana. It is an opportunity given to us for making spiritual progress. In relation to that, the mother says that uh, one can use the night when we sleep for this progress through two interrelated mechanisms or uh, routes. The double effect that sleep has or can have is firstly a negative effect. It prevents the person from falling backwards, which means uh, sliding down. Uh, falling in consciousness, going down in consciousness. Because yoga is not a linear path in which we just keep making uh, progress once we begin. Uh, because of our limitations and uh, feelings which uh, take long to disappear and uh, seldom disappear completely even in an experienced uh, uh, seeker, uh, we keep making uh, those mistakes, we keep doing those things which instead of taking us further towards the goal, take us backwards. And uh, sleep can be an opportunity which can help us prevent falling backwards by giving us that uh, silence, that period of uh, inner silence, when we can reflect and uh, see whether during the day we did something which we are ashamed of, which made us go a step backwards, and uh, then resolve not to repeat such things, uh, thereby uh, reducing the possibility of falling backwards and uh, also strengthening our aspiration. So it can help us prevent falling backwards and thereby losing whatever one has gained. That indeed is painful because there are certain types of lapses in which uh, years of work done by way of sadhana can be wiped out in a minute. That type of lapses also do occur, even with uh, pretty advanced seekers. And uh, one can understand that that sort of uh, lapse can uh, be in the areas particularly of sex, related to sex. Uh, so sleep helps us by reinforcing our aspiration and uh, taking care of even minor lapses, reflecting upon them, going through that inner churning, which uh, may reduce the possibility of falling backwards uh, again uh, by giving us that uh, silent space at night uh, and an opportunity for this inner churning. Sleep has this negative effect of preventing us from falling backwards. It also has a positive effect. Uh, that is, it can help us make some progress. One can uh, reestablish the contact with one's deepest self the psychic being, the representative of the divine in us, the divine spark, the soul, the dynamic aspect of which is the psychic being. One can reestablish that contact and uh, thereby increase the possibility of progress, strengthening our aspiration and uh, by this inner work of uh, trying to reflect on what we have been doing, which we should be ashamed of and what uh, we have been doing which we can be proud of, proud of in the sense of uh, having done something right and uh, not just to pat ourselves on the back, but also to look at that progress that has been made as something which came as a result of divine grace. So once again, uh, acknowledging that uh, divine grace without which much progress cannot be made. So in this way, it helps us make some progress at night while we are in bed. So sleep is an opportunity for uh, spiritual progress, both by preventing us from falling backward and uh, by enabling us to make some further progress. Now here is uh, the architecture of sleep. Now we turn to something more uh, serious and what you may call scientific. Uh, and these, are, these waves are all uh, waves recorded from the scalp, that is the surface of the head. Uh, 
by placing electrodes there. And this type of a recording is what we call an EEG or an electroencephalogram. Now, this is the rhythm of the awake but inattentive state. This is the rhythm, beta rhythm is the rhythm of the awake and attentive state. When a person starts falling asleep, then he goes through these four stages of what is called slow wave sleep. Called slow wave because at the culmination of this process in stage four, the waves are much slower, that is at a much lower frequency than in the awake state, either of these. It's much slower than either of these, awake and inattentive, awake and attentive. It is much slower, a much slower rhythm than that. And this is the rhythm that we call the delta rhythm. It is slower, but higher in amplitude. Uh, this is stage four sleep or deep sleep. And uh, it's called slow wave sleep because the waves are slow. Deep sleep because the person is very difficult to arouse from this state. Whereas when the person is in stage one or two, the person can be easily woken up again. But in stage four, it's very difficult to wake up the person. So it's also deep sleep. It's also called dreamless sleep because during this phase of sleep, the person does not dream. So to start with, everybody's sleep is a slow wave sleep. But then the person goes into REM sleep. REM sleep is the dream sleep because it is during this phase that the person dreams. And it's called REM sleep because during this phase there are eye movements. This is the electroencephalogram showing that this actually closely resembles the uh, rhythm of uh, the awake and attentive state, the beta rhythm. So in a way, you can say the brain has the type of activity which we have in the awake state and this we can easily understand because during the uh, dream, the person may not uh, be aware of the so-called the real world, but at the same time, the person has created a world for himself in which there are things happening and the person may be actively participating in them. And therefore, the person is actually attentive, uh, although asleep. So this is dream sleep or dream sleep, also called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, because the eyes are moving as if, you know, trying to uh, trace with the eyes uh, the events that are happening. And uh, this we can observe in an electrooculogram EOG. If we record that, we find that uh, the muscular activity, the mus activity of those muscles which uh, move the eyes uh, to and fro, left and right, up and down, these eyes, these movement, these muscles are active. So this is REM sleep. Everybody goes through both these the slow wave sleep and REM sleep and how long that we shall see in a moment. So REM sleep is also called dream sleep or paradoxical sleep. Paradoxical because uh, the electroencephalogram resembles that of the awake state, but actually the person is asleep. So that is the paradox. This type of cyclicity that is from slow wave sleep to REM sleep, and then again to slow wave sleep, and then again to REM sleep, this type of a cycle is repeated five to seven times every night. In successive cycles, the slow wave sleep gets shorter and less deep REM sleep longer. To start with, for the first three to four hours, the person is moving from stage one to stage four slow wave sleep and stays in that deep sleep for a few hours. So the first, uh, in the first initial part of the sleep, the first three to four hours are spent in slow wave sleep and then maybe an hour in REM sleep. And then after that, the cycles keep repeating uh, the slow wave sleep keeps getting shorter, but the REM sleep still remains considerable. So, and this type of cycles are repeated five to seven times. And just before waking up, the person is in REM sleep, which means the person is dreaming. So that is the dream that we remember. The rest of the dreams which we had, we generally forget. Now, what are the functions of these two types of sleep? They're not poorly, they're rather poorly understood. Uh, but uh, broadly speaking, one can say that slow wave sleep or dreamless sleep uh, is for repair and restoration. And whereas REM sleep is more concerned with learning and memory and growth. The baby grows, the child grows during this sleep. So both physical growth and in a way you can say mental growth, learning and memory is happening during REM sleep. And uh, this is uh, not only learning of uh, 
what we learn say in school or otherwise, but also uh, learning to move the limbs properly. A uh, very young child, you know, uh, practices or rehearses the type of movements that will enable the child to stand or walk uh, during the sleep and then tries to put it into action when awake. So through this type of bedtime rehearsal, the child learns to use those muscles properly without actually falling. So it's a sort of a risk-free way of uh, uh, practicing those movements overnight. And that's why the child can do it better during the day, less risk of falling, because at night the child practiced quite a lot without any possibility of falling. So these are the two main, these are the major functions of these two types of sleep. Uh, the slow wave sleep or dreamless sleep for uh, repair and healing and restoration and uh, enabling us to get up fresh in the morning and REM sleep or dream sleep, helping us consolidate what we have learned and the child also grows during this period. Now, sometimes a person might have slept for just four to five hours and still gets up quite fresh. Why does that happen? That happens because during these first four to five hours, he has spent most of the time on slow wave sleep or dreamless sleep. And uh, it is during this that the repair, healing and restoration happens. And that's why the person may feel quite fresh even after four to five hours of sleep. But then REM sleep is also important. Therefore, one should not try to restrict the sleep to just four to five hours. Sleep also shows quite a bit of variation with age. The total duration of sleep generally declines during childhood and youth, but stabilizes at the age of about 30 and after that stays constant. It's a, a common myth that uh, in old people need much less sleep. That is not really true. Uh, once it has stabilized at about 30, the total duration of sleep that is necessary stays more or less constant and usually it is from six to eight hours. The change that happens uh, as the person grows older after 30 is that uh, by, the the, by, the, by the time the person is about 60, after that, the total duration may remain the same, but the architecture of the sleep changes. And uh, what happens is that uh, slow wave sleep uh, remains uh, mainly in stage one and two the person has less of the really deep sleep of stage three and four. And that's why it is easy to wake up an elderly person, not so easy to wake up a young person, because even if the person is uh, asleep, the elderly person is most of the time in a slow wave sleep, uh, stage one or two, which are rather shallow types of sleep. He rarely goes into stage three and four, and therefore easy to wake the person up. The duration of REM sleep does not change much in old age. The uh, percentage of the total duration of sleep spent in REM sleep stays essentially constant after the age of about 30. And uh, when it comes to slow wave sleep, the character changes. It is mostly stage one and two, which is shallow. And the in the old person, the sleep also tends to come biphasic. He may uh, complete some of his sleep requirement by sleeping for an hour or two during the daytime and the rest at night. So at night he may sleep a little less, but then the person makes up for it by sleeping during the daytime. Doesn't happen to all the elderly people, but all the same, this is a fairly common pattern and it is within the normal range. Now, if you look at uh, the REM sleep, that is the rate at different age as a percentage of total time spent in sleep, we find that when the child is in the mother's womb, the fetus, it spends all the time in REM sleep. If the child is delivered 10 weeks before time, it's a premature newborn, then 80% of the time is spent in REM sleep. And this newborn, if it is three to four weeks premature, it spends 60% of the time in REM sleep. If it's a full-term newborn baby, then it spends half the time in REM sleep. A young adult spends about 20%. And an old person also spends about 20% of the time in REM sleep. Uh, so after that, this percentage spent in REM sleep becomes constant. But in the older person, the character of the slow wave sleep changes. It becomes shallow, confined primarily to stage one and two, 
the person does not slip into stage three and four, which is the really deep dreamless sleep. So in short, we can say that the young are dreamers. They spend more time in REM sleep, percentage-wise, whereas the elderly hardly sleep. Because uh, dream sleep is not really sleeping. The person is in a way awake and participating in some activity. And when the person is in dreamless sleep, the person is in shallow sleep and can be woken up easily. So the young are dreamers, whereas the elderly hardly sleep. Uh, perhaps experience makes them more alert to what is going around and uh, therefore uh, they seem to be taking note of everything happening around them. <laughs> so that is uh, yeah, that would be a somewhat uh, humorous way of looking at it, mm -hmm. the variation. Now, how much sleep, sleep we do we really need? It varies with the individual. Uh, most adults need seven to eight hours of sleep a day, but some can manage with six and some need at least nine. But uh, how much does one individual need? How much does uh, a given individual need? How much do I need as an individual? The best way to estimate is the roundabout way. The duration of sleep that keeps symptoms of sleep deprivation away is the amount of sleep that I need. It's somewhat similar to the best way to estimate the amount of food a person needs. The amount of food that uh, helps the person maintain constant body weight. That is the best way to estimate how much food we really need. In the same way, the uh, best estimate of uh, the amount of sleep that an individual needs is the duration of sleep that keeps symptoms of sleep deprivation away. Uh, and of course, this applies to good health. In illness, more sleep may be required because if nothing else, more of repair and healing has to happen. And uh, nature has uh, organized that very well. Some of the chemicals released by the immune system when a person is ill, not only stimulate those immune mechanisms which will confine the germ by restricting its growth, by killing it and so on, uh, by activating those mechanisms which will help the body take care of the germ, but the same chemicals, the very same chemicals also raise the body temperature because at a higher temperature, all the metabolic reactions work much better, including the mechanisms for repair and healing. And the same chemical also induces sleep so that the person sleeps longer. So here there's a coordinated effort achieved along with the economy of effort. The same chemical fighting the germ through the immune mechanisms, uh, the same chemical raising the body temperature. So, and so fever is a, up to a point, fever is a desirable response to an illness. It helps us heal. So the same chemical raising the body temperature and the same chemical also forcing the person to sleep longer, which is what the person needs for repair and healing. Now, what are the, how does a person know that the person is not sleeping enough? The person gets symptoms of sleep deprivation. What are those symptoms? The symptoms are that the person feels sleepy during the day. The person feels tired during the day, easily fatigued. The person feels irritable. He gets irritable, gets angry easily, may get easily frustrated or anxious. He finds it difficult to concentrate on mental work particularly, and that leads to poor mental performance. The blood pressure may go up. The person feels more hungry than he should and tends to sort of uh, uh, take more of uh, mid-meal snacks, etc. And thereby the person may also put on weight. The person may have a tingling sensation or a feeling of pins and needles in the limbs. If a person goes with this type of symptoms to a doctor, the first response is to prescribe a cocktail of vitamins B1, B6, and B12. Because the deficiency of these may give rise to these symptoms. But one should also think of sleep because sleep deprivation can also give these symptoms, irrespective of the vitamin deficiency. The person may feel rather cold and they may need more woolens in winters. These are some of the symptoms of sleep deprivation, but the first few are generally enough to give us an indication that I have not slept enough. The person knows it. And that's why it is happening. So if the person feels sleepy, tired, and cannot concentrate on work, the person knows that it is happening because I did not sleep well. How about long-term sleep deprivation? That is 
not just for a day or two, but uh, for weeks and months at a stretch. That in turn leads also to impaired immunity so that the person starts getting attacks of common cold, diarrhea, etc. more frequently. Because of the hunger that the person feels during sleep deprivation, and if this happens for weeks and months and years uh, at a stretch, then the person gains weight. And uh, both because of uh, the impaired immunity, the derangement of various body functions and gain in weight, and the person becomes more susceptible to the various lifestyle diseases like diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease, and in case of women, polycystic ovary disease. And uh, the person may have depression and other psychological symptoms like uh, feeling uh, stressed, feeling uh, drained out, feeling uh, 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 weak, and so on. But the symptoms may not be purely psychological. They may also be psychosomatic. That is, the mental distress may start manifesting in the form of physical symptoms like chronic gastrointestinal problems, such as hyperacidity, peptic ulcer, and irritable bowel. Irritable bowel could be uh, primarily in the form of diarrhea or predominantly constipation or alternating constipation and diarrhea. And one of the common sim symptoms in irritable bowel is a sense of incomplete evacuation. So these are some of the things that can happen because of the psychological symptoms, which in turn may be because of chronic sleep deprivation. Now, if a person can't sleep, the person has uh, sleeplessness, one can understand. But uh, why a person should deprive oneself of uh, sleep, one can't understand because uh, as Rita Ratner has said, I love to sleep. We may or may or may not like to acknowledge it, but we do enjoy sleeping. Uh, it may not be only for pleasure, but all the same, it does give us pleasure. And one can, of course, make other uses of it, particularly in yoga, as we saw. But then all the same, the person loves to sleep. And uh, as she says, it is really the best of both worlds. You get to be alive and unconscious. Unconscious of the various problems which uh, we face during the day, they all disappear at least when we are asleep, nothing really changes and uh, we can change nothing. We become, if we really fall asleep, we become completely oblivious of all those problems, unconscious in that sense. But otherwise, of course, one should sleep consciously. In yoga, we talk of conscious sleep, that is consciously making use also of sleep for spiritual progress. Voluntary, that is uh, deliberate, willful sleep restriction. And that is becoming very common. And one needs to understand why are people cutting down on one of the pleasant necessities of life? It's not just pleasant, it's also a necessity. And it's a necessity that is pleasant. Why are people still cutting down on it? Which, although it is available to everybody, completely free of cost. Some of the reasons why people are sleeping less is too much work. Too much work to do. And uh, that is becoming sort of the norm. Overwork. As if once, unless one has worked enough to not get enough sleep, one has not earned one's bread. Then the avoidable is not avoided. Apart from the work, what can be avoided is also not always avoided for various reasons. Uh, for example, uh, spending some time with the family. So if, uh, and dinner may be the only time when one sits down. And so instead of finishing the dinner in half an hour, the dinner gets prolonged and the dinner gets extended to some other activity which the family might do together, like an after dinner walk or worse than that, settling in front of the TV, uh, gossip and so on. And then that is also the time when one may, like to catch up with friends and uh, those other relations, uh, other rel relatives who are not living with us, but uh, by calling them, by uh, sending WhatsApp messages, by responding to WhatsApp messages, sending emails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so to stay in touch. Now, 
these are some of the things that uh, socially do matter, particularly in collectivistic uh, cultures like ours. And uh, uh, very often, if uh, someone takes a stand that, uh, uh, sorry, it is important, I am enjoying the conversation, I'm enjoying the activity, but all, all the same sleep is more important, I'm going to bed, the person will be considered an odd one out. And uh, particularly if the person who says so happens to be the poor daughter-in-law in the house. And uh, therefore, whether she likes it or not, she also joins in uh, the family gossip and the all the activity that goes on well into the night because uh, the night is something which uh, is our own. So going to bed late is always an option. So you go on extending the night for such activities which are avoidable, but you do not avoid them. And finally, when uh, everybody does go to bed, uh, it is already late, but then there might be a small little baby in the family who went to bed at the right time. And then the baby gets up soon after the rest of the family has retired to bed. And then who looks after that baby? Again, the same poor daughter-in-law. And then who gets up early in the morning? Again, the same poor daughter-in-law because she has to get the tiffin ready uh, for the husband uh, who is to leave for work. So the result is that uh, uh, she is the one who ends up getting the most sleep deprived, uh, even if she's conscious of uh, wanting to sleep well. So whatever is avoidable is not always avoided. Uh, and we feel that somehow we are able to uh, catch up with every, everybody and we are able to uh, satisfy all requirements of life, uh, requirements of work and requirements for uh, staying socially alive. We are able to do all that uh, because the night is ours and in the process get up, uh, go to bed uh, late. But then getting up too late is not always an option not only for the daughter-in-law who has to uh, get the tiffin ready and so on, but also for others. Because after all, the school bus still does come at seven o'clock in the morning. The one has to leave for work at eight o'clock and, uh, and so on. So the fact is that, and then the traffic gets too heavy if one gets late, uh, uh, leaves home late. So the later one leaves, the more the traffic one meets. So all these things, you know, prompt us to and get up not too late. So we go to bed late because we feel that, uh, well, in any case, the night is always available to us and still not get up too late. So what is between going to bed and getting up is what gets shorter and that is the sleeping time. Gossip, which is one of the things which may happen when uh, one is uh, delaying sleeping. The and uh, here is a beautiful quote on gossip, which is uh, one of the of those activities which uh, uh, people not only spend time on, but also seem to enjoy. Uh, to gossip about what somebody is doing or not doing is wrong. To listen to such gossip is wrong. To verify if such gossip is true is wrong. To retaliate in words against a false gossip is wrong. The whole affair is a very bad way of wasting one's time and lowering one's consciousness. So not only is one uh, wasting time and delaying sleep, one is also lowering the consciousness, which is just the opposite of what uh, the aspiration is on the path of yoga. Now, what can we do about it? One can fix one's priorities. What is it that really matters to us? Uh, sleep or the other avoidable activities. Secondly, develop a strong willpower to do what we think is good for our physical and mental health, for our spiritual health. And uh, sleep is one of those things which helps us have all these good physical and mental health and make spiritual progress. Eliminate. Eliminate those activities which are avoidable. Uh, there's a person called Tim Ferriss who has written a beautiful book with a rather unrealistic title, but all the same, the principle is important for all of us. The four hour work week. How one can uh, work professionally for just for four hours a week and still do well. 
uh, one of the things that he talks about is eliminating the non-essentials from life. And uh, one of the things he said he eliminated from his life was reading the newspaper. He says, I haven't read a newspaper for five years or something like that. And uh, haven't really missed a thing. Because if something really important happens, it is in the air. People will be talking about it. You'll somehow end up listening. And then you can ask them a little more detail. Ask them questions. Oh, is this what has happened? Tell me a little more about it. You know, So they get the pleasure, a double pleasure. Firstly, what an ignorant fellow he is. Huh? So some sort of a vicarious pleasure by seeing uh, what a stupid fellow I'm talking to. Huh? So, uh, and the second pleasure of narrating what they know. So they're enjoying telling what uh, they know, enjoying the pleasure, getting the pleasure of listening to their own voice and uh, also considering the person in front of them a fool. And uh, uh, you are getting educated on what has happened and making up for not really reading the newspaper. So eliminate things. Be efficient at work. The same work can be done more efficiently. So try and see how you can be more efficient, do more in less time, again, to some extent, by better concentration and by eliminating within the work what is not really necessary. And in fact, uh, good sleep helps us be more efficient because we can concentrate on work, particularly mental work, better. And even physical work does involve some degree of mental involvement. And therefore, uh, if we sleep well, and uh, therefore can concentrate on work better, our mental performance is good, we can be more efficient at work. So the little extra time that we spend on sleep helps us be more efficient during the day. And uh, that is something which is uh, which will make up for the time spent on sleep. So sleep is not a waste of time. It helps us be more efficient during the day. And uh, also, we can what we can do uh, to make sleep whatever we are able to sleep work more for us by making sleep itself more efficient which means sleep properly sleep well sleep the right way and what that is we shall see soon now if we sleep eight hours a day we have 16 hours available for work during the day. Not that all these 16 hours will be working. There's a lot more that also that is required in uh, the daily routine, what in Ayurveda we call Dinacharya. But uh, say, at least we have 16 hours of waking period available to us if we sleep for eight hours a day. And out of that, some can be spent on work and some on the other necessities, other important things of life. And uh, on the other hand, if we sleep for only six hours at night, we have 18 hours available, waking period becomes 18 hours. So the difference is between sleeping sufficient and having insufficient sleep is only two hours, maybe at the most three hours. But then these additional two to three hours come at a cost. And uh, that's why it's better to eliminate something, be more efficient, thereby save those two to three hours during the day, both by avoiding what is avoidable and by being more efficient at what we are doing. It's better to save those two to three hours during the day than to try and cut down sleep by two to three hours. And therefore, if our life is going in a direction in which it should not, we find that we are sleeping less and suffering because of it, uh, partly by being inefficient during the day. Uh, and then the long-term implications could also be more visits to the hospitals and doctors. One should take time to slow down a bit, take a pause, reflect on how we are spending the day, how we should be doing it, reset priorities, what is it that we can eliminate. Out of everything that seems to be worthwhile and necessary, is there still something that is less necessary? Reset our priorities and then reschedule the day. So these three hours, reflect, reset and reschedule. Well, some people are sleeping less voluntarily because of work, etc., overwork, etc. But then uh, some people may go to bed, spend enough time in bed, but find it difficult to fall asleep and end up 
also having the effects of sleep deprivation. Sometimes sleep restriction and the inability to sleep may be interrelated. If sleep re restriction is due to overwork, and in spite of uh, working more during the day, there is still a lot of pending work left, then that pending work gives stress, becomes a cause of worry when the person has actually gone to bed. And that worry, that stress due to the pending work makes it difficult for the person to fall asleep. So the person has voluntarily restricted the sleep time and whatever time he has kept for sleep, the person is unable to sleep. The person is still thinking of the work that he could not do, which is still pending. So the two may be related, but sometimes they're not related. The person actually spends more time in bed. The person may spend nine hours, 10 hours, 11 hours in bed, but the person has really got very little real sleep. Now, insomnia can be of three types. Uh, the causes and the treatment remain essentially the same, but all the same, uh, it can come in different patterns. The person may find it difficult to fall asleep, but once the person has slept, the person gets a sound sleep at least for five to six hours. The second pattern could be that uh, the person goes to bed and falls asleep easily, but gets up very early, maybe at two in the morning, and after that finds it difficult to fall asleep. And the third pattern could be that the person falls asleep easily, but then keeps getting up repeatedly, sometimes rather disturbed. And uh, therefore, the person has repeated cycles of uh, falling asleep and getting up during the night, sometimes with nightmares. And uh, that's how the sleep remains disturbed throughout the night. The total duration of sleep is less because the person has been waking up repeatedly. And uh, the character of the sleep also has suffered because the person is often disturbed when the person gets up. So these are the three different types of sleeplessness. The major dominant cause of sleeplessness is mental stress. Of course, sleeplessness itself may lead to mental stress. The person is worried, why I can't sleep? And that only increases the sleeplessness. But there could be many other reasons why the person has mental stress. And uh, we shall talk a little more about stress also in some of the subsequent sessions. So mental stress is the dominant and major reason for uh, sleeplessness. Then the person may have inadequate physical activity during the day. Apart from mental work, some physical activity is also necessary. And one of the things that can happen due to inadequate physical activity is uh, that the person uh, finds it difficult to fall asleep at night. Then mental excitement just before going to bed, like reading a thriller, watching a movie with a lot of violence, etc., or having a heated argument with somebody just before going to bed, maybe in person or on the telephone. Now, excitement can also be because of uh, pleasurable events. A pleasurable event also keeps repeating itself at night and the person keeps thinking of that uh, a pleasurable, exciting event that happened during the day uh, when the person is in bed, especially if it happened shortly before going to bed. So all types of mental excitement, particularly that happens just before going to bed, within an hour or two before going to bed, can lead to sleeplessness. Then tea and coffee. Some people can have a cup of tea or coffee just an hour before going to bed and still fall asleep. Some people can't even if they had that tea or coffee three to four hours before going to bed. So the sensitivity to tea or coffee differs. And in general, uh, as the person progresses on the path of yoga, actually becomes more sensitive to the effects of tea and coffee. Whether it is raising the heart rate or whether it is difficulty in falling asleep, to all these effects of tea and coffee, the person becomes more and more sensitive. So tea or coffee, uh, shortly before going to bed can also be one of the reasons for sleeplessness and then sleeping at the wrong time. Because there's a golden time to sleep, if the person has delayed it to 11 o'clock or midnight, then that itself becomes a reason for difficulty in falling asleep. This is a deliberate repetition uh, just to sort of get a reminder on uh, what can happen as a result of long-term sleep deprivation, that is chronic sleep deprivation, whether it's voluntary or whether it is because of sleeplessness or a combination of the two, 
because the two can be interrelated, voluntary restriction and difficulty in falling asleep. As we saw due to pending work, the person sleeps, has restricted the sleep. On top of that, the spending work itself becomes a reason for worry and the person finds it difficult to fall asleep. Or say a child is preparing for the exams, uh, spends less time, uh, keeps reserves less time for sleep, spends more time during the day studying, but then at night the person, the uh, student still gets anxious about the exam, about the type of results that the person might get, about the score in the exams, and uh, the result is that the person finds it difficult to fall asleep. So chronic deprivation of sleep, no matter due to a voluntary restriction or due to sleeplessness, can lead to impaired immunity, so more attacks of common cold, etc., weight gain, uh, lifestyle diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and coronary artery disease, polycystic ovary disease, uh, various types of psychological symptoms, including depression and uh, psychosomatic problems like uh, particularly gastrointestinal problems like hyperacidity, peptic ulcer, and irritable bowel. And because of all this cluster of diseases, uh, losing some of the time that the person thought the person gained by sleeping less by repeatedly going to doctors and hospitals. Apart from everything else, it also costs time. Therefore, it's important to sleep enough and to sleep well. And to sleep well, one must learn how to sleep. So now we'll focus on what is the right way to sleep. And knowing how to sleep is good for everybody to know, not just for those who are sleep deprived, or who find it difficult to fall asleep, that is insomniacs. And uh, the right way of falling asleep is these days called sleep hygiene. It is uh, something which is meant for all of us, including those who are in good health, because it's a part of a daily routine, a part of Dhinacharya, based on living a meaningful life with moderation and wisdom. That is essentially what a yogic life also is, a meaningful life lived with moderation and the highest wisdom available to mankind. The preparation for sleeping well starts during the day. So spend the day well. A day which is well spent, that is spent on uh, meaningful activities, spent uh, loving, caring and sharing, uh, spent productively, leads to good sleep. And on the other hand, if the person has slept well, the person can spend the day uh, well, uh, be more efficient during the day, be more loving and caring during the day, not be irritable and angry during the day, uh, do better work, be better at work. So the two go together. A day spent well leads to good sleep, and good sleep helps us spend, spend the day properly. So... And during the day, some physical activity is important. But then what type of physical activity and how much? In the afternoons and evenings, only moderate physical activity, not heavy strenuous activity. Particularly no strenuous activity within three hours before bedtime. That should be well before this, not within three hours before bedtime. But moderate physical activity in the afternoon or evening is in fact helpful in falling asleep. So one should be physically active. Continuing with the, how the day should be spent so that uh, we can sleep properly. If at all a person sleeps during the afternoon, which may be a necessity for the elderly, at least some elderly people, the afternoon nap should be short, preferably just about one hour. Then the dinner should be both early and light. Early, strictly speaking, it means before sunset. But if that is too unrealistic in the modern world, then at least one should eat before 8 o'clock in the evening, uh, early and light. Then avoid tea and coffee in the evening. Avoid smoking or nicotine because smoking or any other nicotine products like the nicotine patch or nicotine gum and so, etc. Uh, can also keep a person awake. And alcohol also can keep a person awake. So avoid alcohol within two hours before bedtime. Of course, for various other reasons, one should uh, not take 
and in, uh, one should not smoke and one should not use any nicotine products either, as we saw in the, in the previous session. Uh, but uh, if a person does smoke or use these products, then one of the things they could interfere with is also sleep if one has taken them a few hour, within a few hours before bedtime. Now, after the person has actually gone to bed, then what should be the routine? Now, not actually gone to bed yet, but nearing bedtime. The person's bedtime is approaching. And the last one hour before bedtime should be spent on something which is peaceful or relaxing, like uh, reading a, a relaxing book, listening to soothing music, having a loving conversation, then one should avoid too much of fluids close to bedtime. Uh, this will uh, help uh, uh, continuous sleep rather than sleep getting interrupted by going to the uh, toilet for uh, emptying the bladder. A cup of hot milk or herbal tea near bedtime might help. So while the dinner should be light and early at bedtime, a cup of hot milk or herbal tea. Herbal tea means uh, without the herb called tea. Uh, it is something like uh, black pepper and uh, uh, ginger and so on. So that type of herbal tea, not uh, uh, the proper tea, so-called tea. Uh, so a cup of hot milk or another hot drink, excluding tea and coffee, near bedtime might help. Then uh, uh, clean the teeth, wash the feet, empty the bladder, and settle down with a relaxing activity. And uh, it may just before lying down, one can also do alternate nostril breathing or Nadi Shodhan or Anulom Vilom, Vilom Pranayam, which is a relaxing pranayam and can uh, facilitate falling asleep once one lies down. Now you might say that, uh, well, all this is easy to say, but uh, is it really realistic? Can one have this type of a bedtime routine uh, with all this, uh, with the, the telephone ringing and uh, uh, the baby crying for attention and uh, so much work to do? Uh, is it really realistic to spend uh, uh, so much time on just preparing for going to bed? All this is uh, more than an hour of activities uh, during which you are uh, apparently doing nothing which will contribute to the getting uh, out of the way all the work that has to be done and all the immediate necessities like uh, the baby wailing and uh, the uh, and the elderly in the family needing some attention and so on and so forth and the preparation for the next day uh, to be made and so much to, to do. Is it really realistic? Well, the answer to it is that yes, it is difficult. But then if we know what is ideal, we can try and approach it. We may not be able to achieve the ideal and fortunately the body has enough resilience to be able to get away with a lot of uh, uh, irregularities. But all the same, one can start approaching the ideal. Secondly, if something is really important and sleep is important, if something is really important to us, then somehow or the other we'll find the time to achieve at least some of what is ideal. And uh, start moving towards it. So knowing what is ideal helps us uh, develop that strong willpower to be able to do at least some of it, try to uh, be, understand what is it that is contributing the most to our difficulty in falling asleep or restricting our sleep. Now, once the person is in the bed, then uh, what should we do? Firstly, try to reduce all sensory stimuli, which means the room should be as silent as possible. It should be dark. It should be neither too cold nor too hot. The bed should be uh, firm, neither too soft nor too hard. The, uh, the pillow should be proper, the, so on and so forth. This posture of sleeping should be proper so that we get minimum stimuli from outside as well as from the body. And uh, 
Why that helps facilitate sleep is uh, because uh, one of the things that contributes to sleep is the withdrawal of the sensory stimuli. During the day, we have all types of sensory stimuli coming, uh, particularly light and sound stimuli coming throughout the day. And uh, while these stimuli project to specific areas of the brain for us to appreciate what type of stimulus it is, where it is coming from, what is the intensity of the stimulus, what is the meaning of the stimulus. For that, we have specific pathways in the brain, which we talked about, yes, talked about in Yes.03. But then in Yes.03, we also saw in the course Yes.03, we also saw that uh, uh, the apart from the specific projections, which help us appreciate a stimulus properly, properly, all these sensory stimuli fuse projection throughout the brain. So they arouse the cortex, the cerebral cortex as a whole in a diffuse manner. And that's what keeps And therefore, the corollary, when the sensory stimuli are absent, this type of diffuse projection is uh, weakened. And therefore, we tend to fall asleep. So if we reduce all the sensory stimuli, which of course appeals also to common sense, we all know it. And here is the mechanism. Uh, we improve the chances of falling asleep. So reduce sensory stimuli. We must reduce all the stimuli from outside, but how about the stimuli from within? All that we are thinking about. So try to achieve also inner silence. And uh, one way of looking at this uh, noise within is that essentially it is about talking to ourselves. And uh, at the root of it, all speech is unnecessary, all thoughts are unnecessary. If not all, at least much of thought is unnecessary and much of speech is also unnecessary. Because what is it that we are thinking and then dressing it up in words and talking to ourselves? What is it that we are doing which is preventing us from becoming silent within? Regrets about the past which nobody can change, anxieties about the future which uh, we have very imperfect control on and we know nothing about and uh, thinking about people particularly those who did not behave well with us now or even 10 years earlier what the person said to me what the person did to me which is something which we can do nothing about because we can't change others we can change only ourselves so much of the thoughts are unnecessary and dressing them up, in, them up in words and talking to ourselves is totally fruitless. And if we realize that, that itself will help us achieve silence within. Then pray. Uh, what one prays, how one prays can be individual. But uh, prayer is important. And particularly at bedtime, some of the important things to think of would be Gratitude to the divine for all the blessings and uh, blessings which uh, we may not fully deserve, which is because of divine grace. So gratitude for that divine grace and uh, asking for forgiveness for uh, what all we should not have done. Gratitude for all the good things that we succeeded in doing. And then uh, Praying that we get good sleep so that uh, the next day our batteries are recharged and we can have an opportunity to work for the divine yet one more day. So these are some of the suggestions for uh, how a prayer might be formulated. But then prayer is more of an attitude rather than have a strict necessity for formulating into words and uh, that is what matters the most. The best prayer perhaps is a silent prayer with just that attitude of uh, ingratitude. One can relax the body from the toes to the top as one does in Shavasan. Relax the feet, the legs, the abdomen, the chest, the fingers, the arms, and give a little more attention to the head and neck region and strains. If a person is able to take expanding the day properly, have a good bedtime routine, and 
the sensory stimuli have been reduced, the one has achieved inner silence, one has prayed. Then if the person starts relaxing from toe towards the top, the person will probably not reach the top. The person would have slipped into sleep by the time you are halfway up the body. But then it's also possible that the person may still not be able to fall asleep. Then the person can actually start meditating. And uh, a typical meditation is 15 to 20 minutes. So the person can spend those 15, 20 minutes on meditation. And uh, before the person is conscious of having been meditating for 15, 20 minutes, the person has actually fallen asleep. And uh, that is okay because to fall asleep while meditating is one of the best ways to fall asleep. So in a way, there are three routes to sleep. One which is the wrong way, and that is feeling completely exhausted. So that one just can't stay awake. Uh, one the head keeps dropping and uh, the person is dozing. And then the final says, well, now I think I have to stop. And the person just collapses on the bed and falls asleep quickly. Now, this is not the right way to sleep. This is the wrong way to sleep. And uh, the mother says that this is uh, lapse into tamasic inconscience. This is not conscious sleep. The person will not get up refreshed. The person will get up tired in spite of having slept for a few hours. So this is not the right way to sleep. The right way to sleep is that when it is bedtime, take a conscious decision to sleep. You're not exhausted. It's not that you can't stay awake anymore and have no choice but to just throw yourself on. The person is taking conscious sleep, pray, and slip into sleep. Or decide to sleep, pray, relax, and meditate, and while meditating, slip into sleep. These are the right ways to sleep. And if a person feels the necessity to meditate, in a way, it's a blessing in disguise. Further makes the sleep more conscious. So in a way, the third way is the best way to sleep. But suppose even after 20 to 30 minutes of meditation, the person has still not been able to fall asleep. Then what should one do? First thing is do not worry. It's not a disaster. And instead of tossing and turning in the bed, get out of the bed. And do either some one of these things. Read some relaxing book. No, books are of two types. Those which send us to sleep and those which keep us awake. Pick up a book which will which is likely to send, the, send you to sleep. So read or do some mechanical work. Like simple mechanical work, like say you have been thinking of reorganizing your cupboard or your drawer for a long time, but have not been able to find the time. Start doing it and get the satisfaction of seeing a neat shelf or a neat drawer. You enjoy satisfaction from it. Or if the sleeplessness is because of pending work, get some pending work out of the way. Start doing that pending work. Spend an hour or two doing this type of work and then go to bed again. Again, start with the routine, alternateness, nostril breathing, prayer, relaxing from the toes to the top, meditation. Go over that routine. Of Chances are, after having got up and done this for an hour or two, you will now be able to sleep easily. When a person is not unable to sleep in spite of having meditated and all, uh, here are a few do's and don'ts which are important. As we saw just now, get up and do something. Read, do some mechanical work or get some pending work out of the way. Secondly, take it easy. Insomnia, that is sleeplessness, is not a crime. And it's also not the end of the world. Just relax. Even if you have an important lecture or meeting the next day. Because uh, an occasional sleeplessness for a day or two happens to just about everybody. But that doesn't mean the next day is ruined. You can still be at your best in the lecture or in the meeting in spite of having slept less the previous night. If you don't take it as a disaster, if you're not worried about the fact that I have not slept, then 
not having slept enough becomes the cause of worry and worry becomes the cause of not being able to sleep. So don't get into that vicious cycle. Just relax, take it easy. It's not a disaster. It's not a crime. Then some of the don'ts. If you can't fall asleep, don't keep tossing and turning in the bed for too long. Just get out of the bed and do something. Don't get anxious about not being able to sleep. Don't try hard to sleep. One can't force oneself to go to sleep. One slips into sleep. Don't look at the clock again and again. Oh, now it is another half an hour gone, another one hour gone. What will happen if I can't sleep throughout the night? Just take it easy. And uh, you'll find that if you stop worrying about not sleeping, you'll fall asleep, will slip into sleep. That's why we call it falling asleep because you're not forcing yourself to sleep. You're not trying anything particular to actually go to sleep. You're not trying to sleep. You just slip into sleep or fall asleep. Uh, and uh, that will happen if you do not worry about not being able to sleep. So stop worrying about not being able to sleep and instead do other things which can help like prayer and meditation, etc. And if necessary, getting out and uh, growing something. Instead of uh, do some of those things instead of looking at the clock again and again. And uh, also, don't keep thinking that uh, the next day is ruined. Tomorrow's meeting I'll, uh, is spoiled. Tomorrow's lecture is spoiled. What will, I, what will happen uh, tomorrow? Stop thinking about all that. While we've talked about the ideal conditions for falling asleep, one can sum it up in just two words. What is it that makes a person fall asleep? Hard work and a clear conscience. They are, this combination is the best recipe for sleeping easily and well. Falling asleep easily and also having a good restful sleep. Conscious sleep, a sleep which also will help us achieve spiritual progress. That is why a person who has this combination may be able to violate some of the rules sleeping. Uh, he may not have such a good strict bedtime routine. Even his surroundings may not be silent. He can fall asleep even on the railway platform. Whereas a person who does not have this combination may have all the right things and still may not be able to fall asleep. A person who has not ha done hard work and the person who has worked but not with a clear conscience during the day uh, is the one who may be sleeping on a beautiful bed, but not being able to fall asleep. As they say, money can buy a very good bed, but not sleep. What it can buy is a visit to a doctor. What it can buy are sleeping pills, but they are not a substitute for good quality and sufficient sleep. So the best combination is hard work, good work, work that uh, helps us grow spiritually and a clear conscience that is listening to the inner voice coming from the dynamic aspect of the soul, the psychic being. So how to sleep? Let's continue that. Sleep consciously. That is, the process of falling asleep, going to bed is a conscious decision. It is bedtime, so now let me go to bed. and then. During the sleep also we are conscious in a way, in a different sense. And let's see what that means. Some brief awakenings while making a transition from slow wave sleep to dream sleep are quite normal. And that's how uh, the sleep gets cut into what the mother calls slices. The first slice is about three hours. That is three hours of slow wave sleep and then making a transition to dream sleep. Subsequent slices about one hour each, which means uh, early cycles of uh, slow wave sleep and REM sleep, early cycles of dreamless sleep and dream sleep. So during these brief awakenings, while we is making a transition from one slice of sleep to the next, they can be used for visualizing, relaxing, praying, meditating and slipping into sleep once more. It takes less than a couple of minutes. Now what is it that one should visualize? One can visualize that uh, the pillow is not a pillow, but the pillow is the lap of the one whom we adore, the lap of uh, the divine or anyone who symbolizes the divine to us. 
like the mother. So visualize it as the mother's lap or the lap of the one who symbolizes the divine to you and uh, rest your head there with the same type of trust, the same type of uh, confidence that nothing can now go wrong. Uh, everything is taken care of with the same type of uh, feeling that a child has when it would place its head in its mother's lap. So visualize, relax physically and mentally, pray, meditate, pray and meditate to reinforce one's uh, aspiration for spiritual progress. And in just a couple of minutes, you will be asleep again. So these brief awakenings can be used. They are not abnormal. Then how to get up? Bed is a recharge station, not a comfortable home to stay in. Recharging the battery so that we can we are ready for the next day. And we'll be happily doing it, getting out of bed if we love work. Any work is better than no work at all, but there are certain types of work which can be loved. And any type of work can be loved if we look at it as an opportunity for spiritual progress. As Something uh, which we are privileged to do because we have been given the abilities and the circumstances to do it. Bed can be very inviting, tempting, and can be sort of something which uh, we are very finding it very difficult to get out of, particularly in winters. But do not succumb to the tyranny of the bed. Once the mother was asked, why is it so difficult to get up in the morning? She said something to the effect that I don't understand the question. Why? Because the mother had never experienced this difficulty herself. So she could not relate to the question. And she asked, if you are awake, what is difficult about getting up? And uh, truly speaking, if we take it absolutely literally, unless the person is paralyzed, what is the difficulty in getting up? If the person has had enough sleep, the person is awake, the person has a feeling that I have had enough rest during the night, then what is difficult about getting up? And the process of getting up, escaping the tyranny of the bed, can be reduced to three simple steps. Get up, which means sit up on the bed instead of lying down. Pray. And then get down from the bed. Three simple steps. Sit up, pray, and get down from the bed. Once a person has this feeling that I have slept enough, uh, further sleep is not really a necessity. I will not be sleeping, but I will be just lying down in the warm and comfortable bed. That is the time to take these three simple steps. Sit up, pray, and get down from the bed. Prayer is not, in, not important just in itself. Of course, it is important anyway. But it also gives the person a little time in, for changing the posture. From lying down, the person is now in the sitting posture. And after the sitting posture, the person is in the standing posture when the person gets down from the bed. So from lying to sitting up and from sitting up to standing up, every change of posture means a little fall in the blood pressure and then the body's compensatory mechanisms get into action and bring the blood pressure up again. And therefore, this uh, sitting up for a couple of minutes while the person is praying also gives that time for those mechanisms to get activated and uh, at least give us a good blood pressure in the sitting posture and then work. these mechanisms will work once more to give us the right type of blood pressure when we are standing up. This is particularly important in the elderly because like all other functions, these reflexes also get a little weaker in the elderly. And therefore, for them to sit up and stay sitting up in bed is important before they get down. And when they get down from bed to stand, it's better to hold something, port around, so that if they tend to fall, sit down on the bed. Sleep deprived. One of the tendencies to do uh, when uh, 
a person finds it uh, uh, when he's sleep deprived is that uh, if there is work is less or say on Sundays uh, one can afford to get up late, so get up late. One can't make up for lack of sleep by sleeping too much on a particular day. It has to be a fairly regular process. One should not sort of incur a sleep debt, so to say, throughout the week and then try to make up for it by staying in bed for 11 hours on Sunday. That doesn't work. Also, sometimes the sleep deprived, if they have an opportunity, then they feel I have not slept well for three days, so today let me go to bed at seven in the evening or eight in the evening. That again doesn't work. You can sleep a couple of hours before your regular time. You can't sleep too early and fall asleep. You'll just stay awake in bed, waste time and not really be able to sleep. So don't try to sleep too early. And don't use sleeping pills uh, because they create dependence. And uh, once one gets dependent, one also needs a higher and higher dose for the pill to work. One gets developed tolerance. And uh, they induce only shallow, dreamless sleep. That is stage one and two sleep. Very little of REM sleep. And uh, because the sleep is uh, not deep and not complete, doesn't have both those stages, it induces mainly shallow, dreamless sleep. There's very little of dream sleep. If one sleeps with the help of a sleeping pill, that sleep does not give us the full benefits of sleep. However, still tranquilizers and sleeping pills uh, may have some justification for short-term use when it's going through a stressful period in life and nothing else is working. For a couple of days, one may use them, but one should not use them regularly for falling asleep. Long-term uses should be avoided as much as possible. And with all the things that we've talked about, I've seen that people are successful in actually giving up sleeping pills, even if they have become dependent on them, they are able to give them up. So this can be done. Now this is a little a sort of biological explanation for why one should not just sleep enough, but also sleep at the right time. Because sleep and wakefulness are just uh, is just one of the rhythms, 24-hour rhythms that we have in the body, which are called circadian rhythms. And these are tied to the light and dark cycle because it is through the eyes that we receive the light and perceive darkness when that light is missing. And that in turn communicates to the hypothalamus, which is the circadian rhythm generator in the brain. So the hypothalamus does have a 24-hour rhythm, but it becomes more and more tied up to the light because of its linkage with the eyes, turn, communicates this rhythm to the spinal cord, to the sympathetic, which are in turn connected to the, and uh, to the, and that's how stress, and uh, then to the pineal, which produces melatonin, which is the sleep inducing substance. So this is, uh, and then, the pineal has not just the uh, melatonin which puts us to sleep. Melatonin has several other functions. And that is how uh, this 24-hour rhythm is something complex, which involves a lot more cycles in the body than just sleep and wakefulness. So here is uh, the light period. This is the period of darkness. And it is during the dark period that uh, the pineal secretes melatonin, as we can see, and the body temperature falls. The activity uh, levels come down. We feel less active during the night. So all this is uh, some of the, these are some of the rhythms that are tied up. And uh, also the other rhythms as indicated by what all melatonin uh, can do and how it is affected. Melatonin is affected not only by the light dark cycle, but also by the season, the age of the person, physical activity, menstrual cycle, the stress, as we saw because of sympathetic nerve involvement and electric and magnetic fields. And that is why one should avoid these, particularly at night. So keep your cell phone away, don't keep it near the bed. If there's a Wi-Fi connection available to you, switch it off at night. That will induce better sleep. What does melatonin do besides inducing sleep? It has an antioxidant effect, which in turn would to 
uh, prevent disease diseases including cancer and it's uh, which will help us uh, fight infections cancer etc better and influences reproductive that's how sleep wakefulness gets related to all these functions and we have seen some of these effects uh, some of these functions are impaired by sleep deprivation and reproductive function is important because pcod among women is becoming extremely common Now, how about shift work? Here the person is not following this light dark cycle. When it is uh, dark outside, he is working, and when it is light outside, then he tries to sleep. Uh, the body can be uh, taught to shift the cycle, but takes a. Therefore, it's better to have night set a stretch so that within the first few days, the body has to synchronize with the new cycle. And then day duty for a few weeks. It's better than having only one or every week because then those one or two night duties means that the is uh, synchronization with the natural cycle. And before the person is adapted, once again there are day duties. So it's better to have night duty for a few weeks at a stretch, and then day duty for a few weeks at a stretch rather than have just one or two night duties every week. And when the person is on night duty, uh, make the workspace as bright as possible. And even in the daytime, make the bedroom as dark as possible. How about jet lag? Uh, those who travel occasionally, this is not a big problem. The body will adapt and very soon they'll get accustomed to the new place. But those who travel a lot, hardly stay at one place for more than a couple of days and are moving all around the globe, for them, this can be a major problem. And some of the things that one can do is to start preparing a few days before the journey. You know when it is night and day to the place where you are going. So start shifting. Uh, even before you have traveled, uh, your sleep and wakefulness cycle in the same direction as the place to which you are going by shifting it by, say, by half an hour every two or three days. So start a few days before the journey, maybe half an hour every day, shift it in the direction of the light and dark cycle at the destination. So your body is already tuned to that uh, rhythm uh, before you have actually traveled. Then at the new place, when it is day there, spend the day in bright sunlight if possible, or say if you are attending a conference, etc., then uh, Instead of falling asleep while the sessions are going on, it's better to make use of tea or coffee to stay awake and alert during the day, avoiding, of course, tea or coffee towards the end of the day so that one can sleep well. And then instead of tea or coffee, at bedtime, one can take melatonin, which is available in pills at night for a few days. And most important, don't worry about the uh, symptoms of jet lag, uh, which can be more than just a sleep disturbance. Uh, trust the wisdom of the body, it will soon adapt to the new place. Why may a person feel sleepy at uh, 9 o'clock but be wide awake at 11? Uh, this can happen because uh, the body rhythms still work at the in the usual way and 9 o'clock is the time when they sleep. So that's why the person feels. But if he forces it, by 11 o'clock, the golden period is gone. The body rhythms are no longer tuned to sleep. And therefore, the person may find that now I can stay awake for another one hour if necessary. And the person goes on to midnight. In terms of Ayurveda, uh, one would say that uh, from roughly 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. is the beginning of night. And that is the time when Kapha is predominant. Kapha is heavy. That is the time when the person can fall asleep. But following that, uh, after 10, from 10 uh, to a.m. is the Pittakal. One is more. And therefore, active during that period. Not only he gets active, during the daytime, that is the time when we can digest food well. And therefore, at night also, if the person is awake, the person may start feeling hungry. 
But then that is not the right thing because uh, the pitakal of night is not meant for uh, eating. The pitakal of night is meant for metabolizing what has been eating during the day, for <laughs> this, uh, giving a sort of a boost to the metabolic processes, repairing them, activating them. It's meant for that purpose, not for digesting food, which has been eaten during the pitakal itself at night. Is it okay to use an alarm to wake up? No, for a variety of reasons. The alarm may ring at the wrong time. It may ring at a time when one is uh, in deep sleep or one is, in, uh, one is having a dream. Now, that is not the time to wake up. One should wake up spontaneously at the end of a dream uh, when the person is fully rested. So, that is the time one would wake up spontaneously. And uh, the getting out of bed, again, if one uses an alarm, is likely to be abrupt because the person has set the alarm in such a way that after that, no time should be wasted. So the person gets out of bed abruptly. So both the things are wrong. And uh, as we have seen, uh, therefore, one should not try to use an alarm to uh, wake up. However, what one can do is that when one is uh, going to bed, try and think of what time I would like to get up. Just that resolution of what time you get up will make the internal clock adjust in such a way that you are likely to get up around the time at which you have to get up. And sometimes it can be alarm amazingly accurate, plus minus five minutes, as accurate as that. Just that conscious uh, thought at bedtime that tomorrow I need to get up at four or I need to get up at five, not later than that. So if you're sleeping at a reasonable time, you'll find that even if it sometimes occasionally means a little less sleep, five hours or six hours of sleep, you'll still wake up spontaneously at the right time without an alarm. Now, what are snoring and apnea? I put the two together because the causes of the two are related. Uh, at night, our muscles are totally relaxed, including the muscles in the throat, which keep the airways open while we are sleeping. In snoring, what happens is that uh, some of those uh, muscles, when they relax, they start closing the airways and uh, those uh, flap-like thing, that uvula, that starts flapping in the throat and the result is a musical sound. But in some cases, those muscles can relax so much as to close the airways completely and the person can't breathe, that becomes sleep apnea. So the two are closely related. The mechanisms are similar. They are because of the relaxation of the muscles, which normally do not relax that much in sleep and keep the airways open so that we can sleep and yet continue breathing. But the difference is that one who snores continues to sleep because he makes the sound, but all the same, he continues to breathe and therefore he can continue to sleep. It is the person who is sleeping with him who cannot sleep. But the person who snores himself or herself sleeps quite well. But the person who has sleep apnea gets up again and again because the person can't breathe. And then the body has mechanisms which will create a strong urge to breathe. And when he gets that strong urge, he wakes up. He wakes up disturbed. He wakes up in distress and breathes. After he has breathed a little, then he can fall asleep. But then the same thing happens. When he falls asleep, these, those muscles relax, close the throat, and he can't breathe. So the result is that he keeps having these repeated cycles of sleep and getting up. He sleeps for a short period only at a time, gets up disturbed. So uh, when he's sleeping, he can't breathe. When he's breathing, he can't sleep. And he does both the things poorly. He sleeps poorly, he breathes poorly, and the whole night is spent in this disturbed manner. Sleep apnea as well as snoring are more common among the overweight. And uh, therefore, by common sense, some of the treatment for sleep apnea is avoid alcohol because that tends to uh, increase the possibility of sleep apnea in those who get it. Lose body weight because more common in the overweight uh, people. Losing weight may help. And then sleep on the side, not on the back because apnea is more likely when one is sleeping on the back. Uh, the airways close more easily when one is sleeping on the back, so sleep on the side. 
If all this doesn't work, then one can seek professional help and some types of help are now available. Now, this course is essentially about yoga, so we keep turning to yoga and spirituality repeatedly and life is related to these basic aims of life. So yoga and uh, that yoga does involve physical activity, which we have seen is important for falling asleep and also has relaxation techniques like uh, Shavasana and uh, uh, Nadi Shodhan Pranayam, etc. Uh, all that is uh, true that helps us in uh, uh, getting good sleep. But then apart from that, what is more important are the attitudinal aspects of yoga. It teaches us moderation. As the Gita says, you know, one of the verses, Yukta Sopnava Bodhas, uh, Yukta Ahara Viharasya, Yukta Choshtasya Karmasu, Yukta Sopnava Bodhasya. So, Yukta Swapna and uh, sleep and wakefulness. It takes away the major cause of insomnia. That is stress. Instead of uh, stress, it fills life with love, peace, joy and fulfillment. It guides us on how to sleep and how to use sleep well. How to use it for spiritual growth. And gives us good quality sleep so that we get up energetic, not exhausted and tired and can use the day well and puts sleep to good use for spiritual progress. As Sri says in these beautiful lines in Savitri, thy acts are thy helpers, all events are signs. Everything that we do during the day and night helps us. All events that happen during the day help us in that one single fulfilling that one single aspiration, the aspiration of uh, the widening and greatening of the spirit into timeless peace. And in this entire process, waking and sleep are also opportunities. Sleep is also an opportunity. How about these four states of consciousness uh, in, uh, described in the Upanishads? Uh, Jagrit, Supta, Swapna and Turiya. Jagrit is the awake state. Supta is the dreamless sleep state. Swapna is the dream sleep. What is this fourth state, the Turiya? Now, Turiya is essentially the Rishi's consciousness, the mystic consciousness in which the person has uh, the equanimity of the Supta state. He's not affected by what is going on around, completely oblivious of it. He can stay calm and peaceful in spite of whatever is happening. So he has the type of calm and peace which uh, a person has in the sleeping state, the dreamless sleep state. But combined with that is the Jagrit state. So he has, that is awake. So he has the equanimity of the dreamless sleep during the day while he's awake. So this combination of uh, being awake and having that equanimity of this uh, dreamless sleep is what Turiya is essentially. Sorry, I have overstepped today in time, uh, about 10 minutes already. Uh, this is uh, this chapter you will find, uh, this uh, material you will find in chapter 6 of this book, Back to Health Through Yoga, which is available online as well as an ebook, online in print as well as an ebook. And if you have any difficulty, you can write to us. We can courier a hard copy of the book to you anywhere in the world. This is uh, an inside view of the meditation hall of Sri Ashram Delhi branch. And uh, post-COVID for quite some time now, all our activities have resumed and the ashram is open to all of you. For questions or comments, uh, please feel free to drop an email to yes at spirituality.com. Gratitude to the mother and Sri for making these sessions possible. And thank you all for being there. Maybe we can close the session with a moment of silence. Thank you, everyone.